اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا ان الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الامي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراه والانجيل يامرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم اصرهم والاغلال التي كانت عليهم فالذين امنوا به وعزروه ونصروه واتبعوا النور الذي انزل معه اولئك هم المفلحون اللهم اجعلنا من المفلحين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله امين يا رب العالمين I want to start my khutbah with something very simple I think something everybody here understands that as people that live in society we can't help but feel pressure from society and when that is said societal pressure we usually think of bigger things but really it boils down to even the most microscopic details in our life those of you that have children will notice your children want a certain toy and more than anything else sometimes they want that toy because someone else at school has it they want to get what somebody else has that's a form of societal pressure your children start getting a little bit older and they want to dress a certain way and the idea of them wanting to dress that certain way didn't come from their own imagination it came from something they saw on tv that was defined to them as the way to dress or or someone they saw dressed that way at school and is popular and that sort of becomes the defining thing for them and they want to dress that way or look that way or buy that gadget or have a phone little kids wanting to have a phone right what do you need a phone for i don't know my friends have it too why can't i have it you probably parents have heard that logic before do they have it why can't i have it when you get a little bit older the same societal pressure it takes different forms It could be something as simple as you parking your car at your office in the parking lot and your coworker has a nicer car and you go man I need to get ahead look at what these guys are driving 
You know, the neighborhood you live in, and you go visit one of your friend's house who lives in a nicer neighborhood, and the thought is running in your mind, man, when am I going to get to this point? I need to be where this guy is at or better. We're always comparing ourselves to what other people have. And we're constantly vying, consciously or subconsciously, to get what other people have also. This is what I mean by societal pressure. Whether it comes in the, whether it comes in the form of you dressing, or it comes in the form of what you purchase, where you put your money, what kind of career you want to pursue. A lot of times our parents, they give in to societal pressure. So whether their children are made for that or not, they will make sure that you, they say to their children, you better become a medical doctor. Because if you don't, you're a failure at life. Everybody else around us that are successful, they're all doctors. So that's the only thing in life to do. And I'm not saying being a physician is a bad practice. But if your son or daughter becomes a doctor and they did not want to be, I would never want to be their patient. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go to them. If the only reason they chose this profession is because their parents forced them to. Or because of some kind of societal pressure. These are pressures that exist all around us. This comparison stuff is all around us. And it's so, it can become so strong that a person can almost feel enslaved. They're not even free anymore. Which is really ironic that we're living in a, in a society that prides itself over being free, right? It prides itself over having independent freedom. I can do whatever I want, dress however I want, talk however I want, you know, look however I want, spend my money on whatever I want. That's the thing that makes the society pride itself, take pride in itself. And yet, if you go to somewhere as simple as high school, you'll find a bunch of kids that are dressed almost exactly the same. They're just, just almost exactly the same. All the hip-hop kids, are, they look the same. All the goth kids look the same. All the emo kids look the same. It's almost like they go through a uniform. And even the way they talk has to be a certain way to fit in with that crowd. And if you don't fit in with that crowd, then you're, you're, out, you're an outcast. And so when you look at that, I don't, I don't see freedom when I see that. What I see is cultural slavery. This young man or this young woman can't even make that decision of how to look or how to talk or how to walk for themselves. They have to conform to what is going on around them. And sometimes it's willing, sometimes you submit that that is the better way to live. That is the better way to dress or to talk. Or that's the better thing to do with my time. That's the kind of music I want to be addicted to. Or these are the kinds of practices I'll do. Whatever, that's one conscious decision a person makes, that that's the life to live. And sometimes it's even pressured. I've met Muslim teenage kids that have come to me in private, and when you look at them, you're like, man, this, is this guy in a gang or something? And they'll come to you in private and they'll be crying, because they say, I don't want to dress like this. I don't want to look like this. But if I don't, I'll get beat up at school. <laughs> that's cultural slavery. That's a form of slavery. But it's not just about the youth. And they're, you know, whether they become enslaved to musical culture or entertainment culture, and they want to be just like whatever, you know, that famous athlete or musician or actor is. It's, it's beyond that. It's even for older generations. For our older generations, this kind of cultural slavery takes a different texture. It takes a different tone. You have, you did things a certain way in your country or in your society. You, were, you saw that your entire life. You want to make sure your family and your children will do things exactly the same way. Whether that's good for them or not doesn't matter. This is how we do things. This is how it has to be done. And we're enslaved to certain definitions. In that context, what I want to share with you, first and foremost, is a very powerful ayah about the role of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the functions of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ that is described in Surah Al-A'raf. Even though my khutbah today is not about this ayah. My khutbah today is about a, a couple of ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah. But I want to start with this ayah from Surah Al-A'raf. Allah Azza wa is talking to people of the book. Who know that the Prophet has been told about in their own books. So this final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa is foretold in their own books. And Allah is testifying to that in this ayah. That part of the ayah I'll skip through. But I'll tell you the part of the ayah that describes the Messenger's role sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهُمُ الْخَبَائِفِ He commands them to good things. He forbids them from evil things. He opens the doors for them. He makes permissible for them good and pure things. 
and he makes impermissible for them filthy things. This is the, one of the central roles of a messenger of Allah and this final messenger of Allah that he will tell us to do good things, keep us away from bad things, open the door to pure things for us and close the door from filthy things away from us. So we stay away from the filthy things. But then Allah mentions something very powerful. وَيَضَعَ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ And to remove from them, listen to this part carefully, to remove from them the burdens. Isr is a heavy burden. It also actually means an agreement. So combining the two meanings, it actually means a very heavy agreement. A loaded agreement. He came to remove that burden from them and al-aghlal, al-aghlal al-tawq, yuj'al fil yad. You know, the chains that are put in the hands or around the neck. You know, what, what kind of person has those kinds of chains? You know, right? A prisoner. A prisoner has chains around his hands and chains around his neck. Allah says, this messenger came to remove people of burdens and the chains that were around their hands and necks that they were, they were enslaved by. He came to remove them. What chains are these? As society goes forward, the only thing, even in a Muslim society, of course the first thing we're concerned about, like the first generation, the only thing on their minds was, what is permissible, what is not permissible? What is it that we have to do? And what is it that we have to forbid? That was their primary concern. Nothing else mattered, everything else was secondary. But as time goes on in an ummah, society and its pressure starts mixing in. So you don't just have the obligation to abide by what Allah says, now you also have the obligation to abide by what society says. You've got additional chains, you've got additional burdens. And the messenger comes to let go of those burdens. We think we follow societal pressure because it will make life easy. It does nothing but make life harder. A lot of times when people follow a particular tradition, and I'll give you an example closer to home, I'm from Pakistan originally, and this is a problem in Pakistan, I'll tell you. We have to have the most lavish kinds of weddings. We have to, the most exotic, the most over the top, super expensive kinds of weddings. Even if the family can't afford it. Even if they can't afford it, they have to have that kind of wedding. And if you ask the family, why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself in thousands of dollars of credit card debt? Why are you doing that? They say, well your cousin had a wedding like that, what are we gonna show, how are we gonna show our face to your uncle? Or this friend of yours got married, they had a big wedding, how are we gonna just have a nikah at the masjid? What are you crazy? What are we, we're, we have to show our face in society. It's not because the deen says you should go over the top, it's what? Society. Society. And so they, they'll put themselves in all kinds of financial trouble. And imagine a young man and woman who are just getting married, and it'll be lucky if they're young, because if they're from the countries I, we come from, they don't let them get, them get them married until they're like 30 or something. But if they are young and they get married, they're just starting out, and they start their life with debt. They start their married life with this huge burden on them because of this insane party that no one remembers three days later. For nothing else. Just to fulfill a societal urge, this, this pressure that somebody felt. No other reason. What are people gonna say? In Urdu they say, Lo kya kahenge? Right? What are people gonna say if we don't do this? So much concern about what people might say. And it leads you into your deeper troubles for yourself. On the other hand, Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah just wants to lighten your burden. Allah wants to take the load off of you. That's what the deen is supposed to be. And you'll find people that are enslaved to their culture, they're enslaved to their societal pressure. When they talk about Islam, they say Islam is tough. Islam is too strict. That's exactly what these people say. The Islam is too strict. And what's funny is, if they followed even small principles of the deen, their life would be a lot easier. The deen would make their life easier, not harder. <laughs> and what they're trying to follow only lands them in deeper and deeper and deeper trouble. That's what it lands them into. But they don't realize it. A messenger comes to remove these burdens. But there's another meaning of these burdens also in these chains. You know, when we follow a certain way in our life, our children learn from us. Just like our parents learn from their parents. And it's passed down. So when we stand in front of Allah on Judgment Day and we have generations of people who disobeyed Allah because of societal pressure, we're chained to them. We're tied to them. Their burden is our burden because we set that trend. We set that precedent for them. We have to answer for what they've done also. 
They have to answer for themselves and we on top of that, subhanAllah. It's a serious problem. This is why Ibrahim alayhi salam as an intelligent father makes the dua, وَجْعَلْنَا or, or actually we are taught to make the dua, وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama. Right? Make us imam over al-muttaqeen in Surah Al-Furqan. Because on judgment day, we don't want to be tied to people that went down the wrong path. They're going to drag us down with them. Now I want to take you to the ayat that this khutbah is actually about. This is from Surah Al-Baqarah. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, towards the second half of this surah, one of the main conversations is what people follow. What people follow. Who they end up following. And why they follow who they follow. Now this particular passage that I chose has to do with the Day of Judgment. And on Judgment Day, everybody stands up and I want you to think of it this way. There are trend setters and there are trend followers. You followed someone when you did something, you dressed a certain way, you walked a certain walk, you talked a certain talk, you bought a certain kind of car, you moved to a certain kind of neighborhood, you hung out with a certain kind of posse. This, this was your, these were your trend setters. You were around them. Most of what you did was influenced by them. These are your trendsetters. This ayah is about them. These trendsetters. These are the people that people like to follow. إِذْ تَبَرَّأَ الَّذِينَ تُبِعُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوا When those who used to be followed, those who used to be followed, these are trendsetters. When they will be cutting themselves off, disassociating themselves from all those who used to follow them. So here you are, you made your life miserable trying to be like someone, trying to fit in with a certain crowd, worried about what they're going to think of you, how acceptable you'll be to them, judgment day comes around and the first thing these trendsetters do, these leaders do, is they say, I have nothing to do with you. Why are you trying to be like me? I want nothing to do with you. Tabarra alladhina tubi'u min alladhina tabau. I got nothing to do with you. And you'll be like, wait, you're the one who told me, don't rent an apartment, go get into a house. You're the one who said, you have to be smart, go get into a mortgage. Don't worry about halal haram, just do it. And I listen to you and I, you know, everybody around you, you guys are the ones who got me into this. You're the one who told me this is a good business idea. Yeah, yeah, it's got liquor too, but it's okay. Don't worry about it. Oh, Ramadan's around the corner, you can make extra salawat, you'll be alright. It'll clean it all up. Don't worry about it, it's a good business, I'm telling you, a lot of money in it. And I went into this business because I listened to you. I got into it because of you. You know, you have certain circles in the Muslim community. I won't even talk about outside Muslim community, that's inside Muslim community. You have certain circles, you have the business circle, you have the professional circles, you have the physician circles. And in each circle there are certain standards, right? There are certain kinds of parties they like to throw. Or there are certain kinds of gatherings they like to have. And each one tries to outdo the other to keep up with the circle. They, they make each other, they feed each other in their wrongdoing. And now they're cutting off from each other on judgment day. I want nothing to do with you. All that stuff you did is your problem, not my problem. They will all be, Allah makes the jama'ah which combines everybody. The followers and the leaders are all looking at the punishment. And all relationships at that point are cut. You don't care about no society, what nobody else thinks then, it's all gone. All zero. All of that stuff that we were so worried about here, completely erased. And now the people who mindlessly followed. And before I talk about mindlessly following, I have to interject. On our flight here from Dallas, my, I flew with my family to California maybe about 10 days ago. So we're, all the kids were asleep. And so my wife and I were the only ones awake. And you know how they dropped the TV screen? So thankfully the children were all asleep. So we're the only ones, even if you don't want to, it's right in your face, the TV screen, right? And we don't have headphones, so it's a silent film for us. You know what it was? It was the Justin Bieber documentary. So we watched the Justin Bieber doc. it was torture. It was like an hour and a half of Justin Bieber in your face. But wallahi, it was an educational experience. Every two minutes I just look at my wife and go, because you see him walk by and these girls are crying. And they're screaming. And their parents are so happy that he got to touch their daughters. This is how enslaved these people get. This is how crazy they get. This is ridiculous. You know, girls wearing his, his, his face on their book bags, on their shirts. and It was mind-boggling to me how that can be. 
And what's that going to look like on Judgment Day? I got nothing to do with my fans. I want nothing to do with you. وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ And at that point, all of the followers, what are they going to say? وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا And those who used to follow, they're going to be saying, لَوْ أَنَّ لَنَا كَرَّةً لَنَتَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُمْ كَمَا تَبَرَّأُوا مِنَّا If we only had another chance, we would cut ourselves off from them like they're cutting themselves off from us now. They're saying this on Judgment Day when they're, and they're crying, they're saying if we only had a chance. Do they get a chance? No. Do you and I have a chance? Yes. That's why the ayah is telling us this. Don't wait till the point where you regret it. Be that now. And for a moment I want to talk to the parents here. When you buy your, when we bought our children Disney gear, when we buy our children you know, we will let them watch whatever they want to watch on TV, or it's just cartoons. It ain't just cartoons anymore, let me tell you. It ain't just cartoons anymore. They put a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> right? And I used to teach at an Islamic school back in the day, and you know, uh, these little girls would have like, you know, uh, Hannah Montana book bags. Coming to Islamic school. Right? They've got these girls book and they're fans of them, and they watch all the shows and stuff. And when these same girls that are on Disney or whatever, Nickelodeon or whatever, when they're teenagers, when they're 20, when they're 19, they're half naked. And now what are you, what if, what are you going to do? How are you going to explain that to your children? You allowed them to be trend followers. You did that. I did that. We have to be cautious. What are we allowing our children to become? Before you know it, they'll be out of your control. They'll be enslaved to that culture. Some of you are experiencing that now. Some of your children are teenagers and you don't even recognize them. Like, what happened to you? Why are you dressed like that? What, what, what are you doing with your hair? What is that? You won't know, but it's a trend. And they're just following. That's all they're doing. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا لَوْ أَنَّ لَنَا كَرَّةً فَنَتَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُمْ كَمَا تَبَرَّأُوا مِنَّا كَذَلِكَ يُرِيهِمُ اللَّهُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ That is how Allah shows them all of their deeds. So they can not just حَسْرَةً عَلَيْهِمْ It's unique. Allah says حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ Regret on top of regret on top of regret falling over them. There's, you know, punishment itself is bad. But regret is a form of punishment itself. When you regret something, when regret really overtakes you, it's a kind of torture itself. Allah says it will be coming on them over and over and over again. Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I change myself? How did I allow myself to be like this? And they won't be coming out of the fire. وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ اللَّهُمَّ لَا تَجْعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ Right after this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a commandment about consuming halal. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ It's really interesting because most of the time when we follow trends, what do we leave? We leave the halal. We leave the permissible. And we pursue the impermissible. So Allah reminds us, look, don't fall into those trends. Don't fall into that pressure. Consume that which is halal, what is good and pure. Don't let the footsteps, don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. And here we are thinking we're following footsteps of society, and Allah is telling us, no, 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 that was just a, that was just a shallow cover. The reality of it was, these were footsteps of shaitan. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ And then the last thing. What does shaitan do? What, is his, what are the two things that he will get you to commit? إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُّوءِ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ He'll command you to evil. He'll command you to shamelessness and to say things about Allah you have no idea of. I want to explain that briefly and this khutbah is done. When people want to follow whatever it is they want to follow and they don't want to hear about the deen. The deen is, Islam is too strict. I don't know, I, I go to Jum'ah and stuff but that's, that's already more than enough. I'm doing Allah a favor by being on Jum'ah, on, you know, showing up. I don't even need to be here on time. If I just show up before they start praying or before they say salam, that's enough for me. Last in, first out. Right? That's the majority of the congregation usually. If you're that person, then listen to this. Then just listen for a moment. If you think you're doing Allah's deen a favor, and what you really need to live your life for, has already been defined for you by your culture, by, your tri by outsiders, by what everybody else follows, then you're not free at all. You're not free at all. You're a slave. 
The only ones that are truly free are Allah's slaves. They don't, they don't feel the need to be like everybody else. They don't feel the need to spend their money in places that are useless, that are, that are a waste. They see above that, they're mature. And so in this note, I just want to give you an example of our daughters, because this is an important subject, something I've been talking about recently, and I feel it's critical in, along these lines. Trend setting, and what, it, what effect it's had, happening on Muslim girls, on our daughters. There's a crisis in the Muslim community when it comes to our daughters. A crisis of self-esteem. A crisis of self-esteem. We're already a different culture. Before 9-11, we're already a very different tradition than regular Western society. We're very different in many ways, especially in the way we dress, especially in the, in the, in the you know, commitment we have to modesty. After 9-11, it's been 10, 10 years now, and the hatred and the animosity and the, 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 the spiteful language that spews out of people's mouths about Islam has increased tenfold, if not a hundredfold. So it was already difficult to follow, and now it's become something everybody hates. And in the middle of all of that is our daughters that go to public school, even if they go to Islamic school, doesn't even matter, then they go to college, and they're covering themselves, and they see girls dressed however they're dressed, and a thought runs in the mind of a young Muslim girl, why can't I dress like that? Man, anything fun is haram, she looks so pretty, why can't I look pretty? Why can't I be like that? That thought crosses her mind, she's afraid to say it, but it crosses her mind. And she's always thinking about it, and she's depressed, I look ugly because of this thing, people make fun of me. You know, why are we such, such backwards, such a backward society? I don't even know why I have to wear it. That's a serious problem. That's trend setting inside, even if it's not outside. That's a, inside, it's a bigger problem. The heart is now submitted to what is rebellion to Allah. This only happens when we don't give our sons, and especially our daughters, enough self-esteem. Where does self-esteem come from? This is the last thing I'll share with you. Because this, this problem of following trends in society is a big one, but probably the biggest component of that is saving our children. Saving our children from becoming swept away with the flood. So this is the last bit I want to share with you. And that is we have to acknowledge, fathers especially, have to spend time with their daughters. Fathers have to encourage their daughters. Fathers have to appreciate their daughters. Fathers have to tell their daughters they look beautiful. So they don't have to look for that from some idiot on Facebook. They don't have to do that. Because their fathers are telling them that. They get that, you, you're, you know the kind of self-confidence a girl gets from her dad is irreplaceable. Not even the mother. Mother's critical, but not when it comes to this. When it comes to the acknowledgement of a father. When is the last time you talked to your daughter? With those of you that have daughters. Actually had a conversation with her. You know, our daughters, I, have, I, I brought two of my four daughters with me on this trip. Girls talk a lot. They talk a lot. They never run out of things to say. Which is why for, for men, a lot of times, as the, the moment you hear them, talk, okay, 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 yeah, 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 that, that's nice, that's nice, and you don't really listen. <laughs> right? Listen to your daughters, talk to them. Because if you're ignoring them now, when they get older, they'll be ignoring you. They will be ignoring you. It doesn't matter if they're talking about hair clips, or what their friends said at school, or what coloring projects they were doing, or where they visited, or what show they... whatever, talk to them. Communicate with them. They need that from you. You, you need to play that role as a father. We, do, we cannot allow our children to fall into that, you know, get swept away into that culture. We can't. So this is one, you know, last bit of advice that I really, really wanted to share with you. Because if we don't do that, Wallahi, I'm telling you, if we don't do that, we are cheating our daughters from a proper raising. We're cheating even our sons. And since I talked about daughters so much, I'll say just one thing about sons. Play with your sons. Spend time with your sons. Play sports with them. Most of our dads are so out of shape, they come home, they pick up the child for two minutes, and then they're like, ah, ah, and they're just passed out on the couch. Right? Get in shape for your kids. Not for yourself, for your kids. Play with them. You need to be their, a better friend to them than anyone else. Because wallahi, this society offers lots of evil friends. It does. And before they make those kinds of friends, they need to find a, their best friend in you. It's not the way we did things back home. Back home, you weren't friends with your dad. Your dad came home and you sat straight. Your dad spoke and you stood up and responded. It was a relationship of respect. A distant relationship. 
You don't chill with your dad. Right? You don't do that. Here you have to do that. You have to do that. Not just you should, you have to. We have to become those people. Because if we don't, again, the, the, the flood will come and just take our kids away. It will just come and take them away. I pray that we're not of the people who are followers of, of evil trends. I pray we're the kinds of people, and you know, when Allah talks about these trend followers, He did mention, here's a trend you should follow. فَاتَّبِعُوا مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ Hanifa. Follow the way of Ibrahim. And you know what the way of Ibrahim is, right? Didn't follow anybody else. <laughs> Everybody's worshipping idols, now I'm going to break them. Everybody's going this way, he's going to go that way. He's going to go the way Allah wants him to go. That's the trend to follow. That's the people we become. May Allah make us from the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. May Allah make us understand his book the way it should be understood. May Allah protect our children from falling into the tide of cultural, for, cultural forces and pressures. May Allah make us of those who understand his book, love his book, and implement his book in our lives. May Allah open the doors of its wisdom and the wisdom of the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam to all of us. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا